Well, this photograph uh, by uh, Llewellyn Rowe, we knew him as Bud, uh, is totally new to me. I had never seen this before. But it is indeed a, a bottle cottoning machine, this stuff, a wad of cotton on the top of uh, bottles containing whatever it might be, aspirin or bufferin or any dry product. And what it does is feeds a uh, cotton in a rope form, really. It's a huge strand of, of cotton or a substitute for cotton these days out of a large container. It feeds it into a uh, device which then cuts off a predetermined length, mm -hmm. uh, forms it into a, a U-shape, and then plunges it into a bottle uh, acting as cushioning material uh, for the product inside. So when it is shipped and so forth, there's no damage yeah. to the product. Since that time, which was uh, 1934, when my uncle, uh, Enolac, so uh, developed the first automatic cottoning machine. And there have been several new, uh, newer designs, improvements over the years. Uh, until the, uh, oh, I would say 1970s, 1980, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, and it's widely used through, throughout the industry, uh, or it was when I was there. I've been out of there now for some, let's see, I've been retired for 30 years. I've been out of the company for 40 years. Right. There had been a machine developed uh, I don't believe, however, that they were fully automatic. They required a person there to perform some part of the function. Mm -hmm. And so he is credited uh, with the first automatic machine. Mm -hmm. but a typical packaging line for pharmaceutical uh, products, uh, dry, dry products, would be a conveyor carrying bottles, first of all, to a... Uh, a cleaning machine. Wow. Now, bottles are cleaned anyway, coming from the factory. However, uh, cleaning for prior to the insertion of product, uh, simply a blast of compressed air. Mm -hmm. And then they would come into the uh, a filling machine, which uh, would count and fill the number of product into the bottle uh, automatically. Yeah. And then the next step would be this cottoning machine mm -hmm. where the cotton is inserted. From there, it would go to a uh, capping machine to put the cap on top, and then to labeling and cartoning and so forth. And that's basically what a, a packaging line uh, right. consisted of as, you know, in the day that we were producing them. Uh -huh. The actual product, of course, uh, was... Uh, manufactured in-house because uh, all of this, this, this equipment would go into a manufacturer of pharmaceutical uh, products. That's mm -hmm. where all of the packaging lines would be installed. They were oh, not... of course, they can't travel they were not, like that. They were not... Uh, there are what, what are called contract packagers that might import a number of the components, but for the most part, 90 some odd percent were in the manufacturer's facility. I mean, there were multitudes of firms, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, as you mentioned, uh, Sterling Drug, uh, 
Philips Milka Magnesia tablets, okay. all, okay. Oh. any number of them, uh, both, uh, both prescription and over-the-counter products. The, the company, when founded by my uncle, was simply at his home. Uh, he, was a, uh, really? he was a born engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, he had no formal engineering training and uh, he's just mechanically inclined and, and an excellent designer. And the opportunity came to produce a machine to insert cotton into bottles. And that's how it started. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, in later years, uh, maybe a year or two later, he rented space in what was the uh, then the Salvation Army building at the corner of Elm and Academy Streets, um, which is now part of the Fitchburg Art Museum. Right. I, okay, I looked at the history of that building. Yeah. And so, uh, and from there, uh, the, the wow. company grew and uh, had a new facility built on Ashby State Road, 47 Ashby State Road, which is now a medical building. Right. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, part of the organization, uh, sales and engineering, moved to a separate facility on Cascade Street yeah. uh, because business was so good that we had to expand. Wow. And then the final uh, facility, uh, because of growth, was uh, on Mead Street in Lemonster. Uh, behind the uh, Cadillac dealership. Uh, oh, okay. We had that right. complex of buildings there. And... Uh, are those still there? Should I go and make a, take a picture of it? <laughs> well, <laughs> there are other businesses in there now <laughs> because the, the company there? was company was sold in uh, 1978. Uh, and uh, I left there in 1981. Ah. I was the 11th employee. Ah. Uh, and uh, um, my father had worked there prior to uh, his death, and uh, you might say I kind of took his place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a family-owned concern, right. of course. Wow. And uh, but in later years, uh, we did uh, an export business as well. Uh, I've seen that. I was I was fortunate in in personally in growing with the company, mm -hmm. and uh, really ended up as the export sales manager, traveling in uh, countries in Europe, um, South America, Canada, all the time uh, utilizing uh, past experience in building these machines and now being able to sell them, but not only sell them, but move into, go into a facility where someone's having a, a problem to be able to solve it as yeah, well. So it was it. a good sales tool. So a number of different machines uh, for counting and filling of tablets and capsules, uh, electronic counting. Uh, one of the uh, later machines was to detect particulate matter in injectable solutions and in vials and ampules mm -hmm. and uh, very interesting work. And another interesting uh, machine was we called it a coating pan. Now let's look at M&M candies. Right. Uh, they're sugar coated. Right. It begins with a core of chocolate. So how how did the sugar coating get on there? Well, coating pan is a rotating kettle, you might say. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the cores of the product are dumped in and the pan rotates and with heat and a spray application of sugar, colored sugar, colored sugar begins yeah. to build up a coating on every every little M&M. You're kidding. The more sophisticated machinery uh, developed later, which were called coating towers. These are huge machines where rather than the product being in a rotating pan, was held in suspension 
by a flow of air, sure. heated air. So uh, very sophisticated. And so air is going upward. Air is going and upward, yes, shots. and the spray of the sugar coatings is applied and the heat is applied. And so I never did get very much involved with that, but uh, it was very interesting to see. Uh, before 1934, he was, uh, he worked for the C.H. Cowdery Machine Works. Oh, right. And uh, I don't know specifically what he did, but I, I imagine he was a designer there. My father also was a, uh, uh, a machinist at, mm -hmm. and that's where I had my basic machinist training. So which I later later now. then became uh, part of Dixie Cup uh, organization right, right, and, yeah. and, and then American Can. Right. So we were all alumni of what formerly was C.H. Cowdery Machine Works. Oh. One of my cousins, uh, who also worked for the company, uh, had taken a course from... In, Correspondence course, International Correspondence Schools, I think it was called. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, yes, I was, I guess I was kind of a born mechanic as well, but uh, he gave me his uh, textbooks to study a little bit and so forth, and I did, so yeah. So I, I did get involved in, in, in some design work, yes. One, one little story I like to tell I had the opportunity to go to uh, Scotland, the town of Airdrie. Airdrie was, uh, a, had a facility of the Boots Pure Drug Company Limited, oh, the sure. major, major firm in, in England and the UK. Sure. I heard, yeah, sure. And uh, wonderful uh, um, quarters that we had, uh, the headquarters of the Oh, the company was in a former mansion. Uh, and all that goes with a mansion, you might say. Uh, we stayed overnight there, we ate there and so forth. And uh, in the morning, the maid would come and <clears throat> we, would, we would get knocked up in the morning by the, right. the, the door and door, door being knocked. She'd come in and start a fire in the fireplace and give us uh, tea and crackers or something, whatever right. it was, and said, breakfast will be served in 30 minutes. And uh, I like to tell people that the first time I, here I am a country boy, you might say, uh, sitting down at a table with four or five utensils to the left of the plate, another four or five to the right of the plate, and something here and something there, and I said, what do I do with all of these implements? So I was totally immersed in uh, British culture yeah. for a week. That's amazing. And it's one of the most educational uh, experiences that I can relate because in a week I learned what I really should know if I'm going to be involved in business and traveling and dining and entertaining and so forth. It's wonderful and, and it's also nice to be uh, picked up in a limousine at the airport wow. yeah. and so forth. Uh, they always, they all thought I was a big wheel or something, but I was really only an employee. <laughs> but you had this name of the company. Well, that, so that, might yeah, be that why. we had to be very careful with that, yeah. Oh, really? Well, I, I never wanted to, yeah. Of course, I said, of course. I, I'm, I'm only here as a service man. Even in Germany, I uh, um, traveled frequently. And in fact, uh, when there was a meeting going on and speak with 
German being spoken, uh, I was able to get the gist of what was mm. being said. My parents were both born here in Fitchburg. I see. And however, they, uh, they wanted me to know a little bit the culture and the language. And I firmly believe they spoke Finnish only to me during my early years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the Finnish vice consul at the time was Henry or Heike Puranen. Henry Puranen, yeah. and stuff. he told my parents I spoke the most beautiful Finnish he had ever heard from a child. Really? Today, I know. I, in school, my early days in school uh, were very difficult because I was, I was learning English, I, I believe. I don't know this. I believe I was learning oh, English. That's cool. Yeah, that it's makes cool. sense. Yep, and uh, being very shy, you know. My my late wife Agnes, uh, she was uh, she was of Armenian descent, right. uh, but her parents also spoke Greek. Really. And Agnes uh, would uh, hear them speaking in Greek, but she somehow learned enough that she knew she she knew what they were talking about. <laughs> I knew her in school. I knew of her really in school. She was a year, a year after me. Uh, yeah, but uh, we were uh, we were both involved with the in the Masonic facility and uh, fraternity, and uh, she and her husband and Agnes and I would travel together and mm -hmm. uh, became good friends. And her husband died. So and eventually we, you know, we were both knew each other and so forth, so yeah, friends yeah. and so. Oh, that's very so, cool. That's and that lasted 40 years. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my first marriage was 25 years. Wow. Because 40 years of Agnes. Yeah, yeah. It's now I'm unmarried. No, <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, it, I was the 11th employee that's right. But then uh, we grew, and at one point during my tenure there, uh, we had 80 employees. And that was a reason for expansion of facilities as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so many people, even today, open a bottle of pills. Well, they're not really pills. They're tablets or they're capsules. True. The pill was a handmade uh, concoction of of ingredients, really? and they actually rolled it into a ball by hand, and that that was the pill. Uh, these tablets today are made uh, from a powder material. All of the all of the ingredients are in a powdered form. And then they go into a tablet press, which uh, under high compression simply creates the tablet shape. Uh -huh. it's, and uh, same with, uh, with the capsules. Now, uh, they're filled with a powder. You know, with the, with the, they are? Sure. Uh, generally speaking, a powder right. filled capsules, it's a two-piece capsule. Is, and then, of course, there's a soft gelatin capsule, yeah, which a uh, liquid in, inside of it. You know, so there's a number of different products. Yeah. Mm. You know, we're all familiar with the term, with the name Bayer. You know. Yes. Bayer, and in Germany, it was it's an offshoot of what it was in Germany originally, which would be Bayer, be a you know, same spelling, spelling. Bayer, oh, okay. Germany. So, uh, yep, Bayer. And uh, a lot of the uh, firms here are German, you know, orig have origins in Germany. So, yeah, we sold to a firm out of Longmeadow, Massachusetts, was Package Machinery, it's the name of the company. Yeah. Package Machinery. I think Package Machinery then sold to someone else. Uh, it's an Italian firm, which uh, 
when I wrote the history of the company, uh, uh, I even visited them down in, in Lemonster at the time. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I forget. It was IMF or something. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, they were still carrying the product line. Okay. One of my one of my trips was to uh, uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Well, in any case, I was there for a week, and. Uh, it was uh, midsummer there, midwinter uh, here, yeah. and uh, the facility have it was a huge packaging machinery exhibition. The hall was so huge they could not air condition it. So the show hours were from three in the afternoon till eleven at night. And uh, not speaking Portuguese, we had a uh, we had a young lady as an interpreter, mm -hmm. and uh, so we did best we could. And very nice, she invited me to her home to have dinner with her parents. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it was yeah, very nice. That's really yeah. neat. Yeah. yeah. During this same experience, I. Uh, As I said earlier, I don't remember much Finnish, but I, I do remember a little ditty, uh -huh. a little ditty in the Finnish language. Cool. And so I it was, must have been in the second little bar we went, or maybe the, maybe the next one. Uh, there were a group of Finnish sailors in there. Yes. I sang the little ditty for them, but they, uh, they, they couldn't believe this. American comes over there and sings this little ditty right. that they know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. You did so much for American uh, foreign relations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. 